Thank you for being here. And good morning to you, Mr. Robert Battle. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It must also be said that you are a spiritual community builder, which is something we're going to be getting into. Excellent. But let's dive right into your formation as an artist. You grew up in Miami, Florida, yes. in a family that was very artistically oriented. Yes. You sang in church. You had poetry readings at home. You also played the piano. You're a Renaissance man. Yeah. At what point did you realize that dance was your calling? When I finally caught the football, um, <laughs> finally caught it, you know, I, I, I did not like sports, uh, mainly because I wasn't good at it. But finally, in junior high school, mm -hmm. I caught the ball and I ran. Nobody could catch me, mm -hmm. mainly because no one was running after me because I was running the wrong way. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's when I knew I was not going to be a great uh, football player. But mm -hmm. certainly, um, for me, the arts was a part of our upbringing. We yep. didn't call it the arts. It was just a way of life. You know, mm -hmm. my mom played piano for the church we went to. Mm -hmm. uh, she was an English teacher. But mm -hmm. moreover, she was an actress. Mm -hmm. You know, so we watched all the Betty Davis movies. To this day, when we call each other, we sometimes speak in lines now from Voyager. all about Eden, but now Voyager. <laughs> You know, so I had to be something different. Yep. Um, and so I started playing piano and taking piano lessons, singing, soprano, my I add. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And um, you used to do a mean Whitney Houston impersonation. I, I did. I, in fact, I used a Whitney Houston song when I auditioned in junior high school for the Payback Performing Arts Center. Um, so yes, I did. And then the voice started to change, uh, and my imitation of Michael Jackson seemed to not be that absurd. <laughs> because <laughs> I eventually auditioned for dance mm -hmm. um, in my high school, and then that took me. And of course, uh, seeing the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater when they came there on tour. Well, how old were you when that, that happened? I was about 12 or 13, something mm -hmm. like that. And didn't that change your direction in terms of what kind of dance you wanted to do? Because you had wanted to do ballet originally. Yes. I mean, I remember my first ballet slippers. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I'm a prince, not prince. A, a prince. Um, and I could just do pirouettes and be lovely and all of that. Uh, because that was my understanding of dance. But when I saw the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and saw his masterpiece, Revelations, it brought me right to my upbringing in the church, the spirituals that I was hearing, uh, the poetry about our people and through which we came to be where we were. Mm -hmm. And something that I saw in Revelations reflected all of that. And that's mm -hmm. when I knew dance was larger than I could even imagine. So. And that was going to be your, your, your calling. Yes. So you earned a scholarship to uh, Juilliard, a, a legendary class that included Viola Davis and, and many other luminaries. No one ended up Schlepping coffee. Audrey McDonald. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what did Juilliard give you that was indispensable and that has been indispensable in, in your career? I think um, courage, mm -hmm. you know, because I sort of had to, to push through, and it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. um, but you're surrounded by all of these excellent artists, you know, who are sort of going through the same awakenings, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first came, I, of course, I felt that I knew more than my teachers. <laughs> uh, you know, when you come from a smaller town where, you know, you're sort of in the front of the room and, and all of this stuff, and then you come and they sort of break you down and, you know, sort of reteach you. And I thought, please. <laughs> and so I was going to leave. In fact, I had made my plans to come back uh, to Miami. I was going to go to New World School of the Arts College. Mm -hmm. I made all the plans, and I knew that if I made the plans that my mom, as long as I had a plan, would support me. Mm -hmm. So I made the plan. I knew how I was going to have money in my pockets, full scholarship. Mm -hmm. And so I went to my mom and I said, so this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And this is how I'm going to do it. And she said, in all her wisdom, as mothers do, uh, with the passive aggressive thing, she said, <laughs> <clears throat> well, that's wonderful, you know, and I'm behind you, whatever you do. But sometimes when you start something, you might want to think about finishing it. Ooh. And so I did. So and I, here we are. And, and here we are, <laughs> all these years later. Right, right. So we're going to fast forward. We're going to pass your years in the Parsons Company and your own personal company, Battleworks, and fast forward to 2011, yeah. when after choreographing many pieces for the Alvin Ailey Company, you were handpicked by yeah. Judith Jameson herself 
to succeed her. That never happens, by the way. Someone has to be dying, yeah. and then on their deathbed, they say, it's you. Yeah, yeah. So right, this is right. the first time yeah. the torch was actually passed. Yeah. How, tell us about that, that moment when you learned you were going to be the new leader, the only the third leader of this legendary company. It's amazing. Is that It's so layered, you know, mm -hmm. with... with uh, so it's often hard. I have to usually pick one angle, you know, mm -hmm. so we're not here all night to say <laughs> the significance. But the significance of, of being born completely bow-legged, being born in a situation where my great aunt and uncle had to step in to raise me, mm -hmm. uh, growing up in Liberty City, which is quite tough, mm -hmm. if, as one can imagine, mm -hmm. uh, being picked on, all of the things that could make you feel like an outcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but seeing the company, having the hope of someday being as beautiful as what I saw on that stage, mm -hmm. uh, and then sort of moving through the ranks, you know, uh, never knowing that someday the legendary Judith Jamison, you know, on April 28, 2010, but who's counting, <laughs> uh, would stand before me and say, it's yours. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember seeing Judith Jamison when I would go over uh, to, before we had our first permanent home, mm -hmm. Joe Miles Center for Dance. Um, I remember going into, we call it 211, that was the address. Uh, and sometimes I would spot her sort of walking through the hall or something, and I go, ah, never thinking, I would hope to just speak to her. Right. But never thinking someday she'd be standing in front of me saying anointing you yeah so it's a it's it's many levels and i don't think of it as a job i think of it as a calling it is uh and so i'm walking into this life that has been prepared for me and doing my best you know to to well you're doing a yeah. beautiful job and Thank you. every review that has come out this season looks like your mother wrote it herself <laughs> or dictated it to ben brantley um and so you're stepping into the shoes of legends. Yes. Alvin Ailey himself, Judith Jemison herself, these are bigger than life. And I know one of her pieces of advice was follow your voice. Mm -hmm. So how do you step into this legendary company and yet maintain your own voice and make it your own? Well, I think one of the ways is to have the person who chose you, who you completely trust, tell you that I chose you because of what's in your heart, in mm -hmm. your head, in your imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, so even those moments when I'm going, like a deer <laughs> in headlights, <Yep. laughs> which my first two years uh, behind the scenes, I was going, what? <laughs> um, having them keep reinforcing you uh, with the idea that what you have to say is what is needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a powerful thing. I remember mm -hmm. hearing uh, the actress Bea Richards saying mm -hmm. some advice that she had gotten from someone who said to her that you have everything you need lacking no essential characteristic. Mm. Perfect. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's powerful. But that's not easy, you know? No. It's not easy to trust your own singular voice. Mm -hmm. But it is necessary if you're going to tell the truth and have it come out the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. So even if something doesn't work, as long as I'm telling the truth about what I feel in my heart that needs to happen, then I'm fine with it. So what are some of those truths that you've wanted to bring to the company and have sought to bring? One of the truths for me is that these dancers can do anything, mm -hmm. you know, and they should only be limited by mine <laughs> or their <laughs> imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think so. So that statement to me is a social and political statement, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. certainly about African Americans in terms mm -hmm. of some of the great influences for me were, you know, Marian Anderson, Leontine Price, mm -hmm. you know, the great opera singers. Yeah. Yes. Hearing them sing Tosca. Yes. And thinking about that image and how. People when, wouldn't have imagined that. Exactly. Yeah. So things like that have always inspired me. So that mix of repertory that I bring uh, to the company, I think, reflects my feeling about the fact that you should only be limited by your own imagination. But mm -hmm. also remembering where we came from. Remember yes. that this remembering that this company started on the brink of the civil rights movement. In 1958. Yes. It's about to be 60 years old. Yes. Mm -hmm. In dark times. Mm -hmm. Reflective of now. <laughs> uh, history repeats itself. History repeats itself. But, but this company has provided inspiration and spiritual uplift to people for almost 60 years. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. a way, it has provided a kind of shelter. 
for people to come together from all walks of life. And so that, to me, is my kind of guiding light. Well, let's speak about shelter. Segway, yes. you have uh, brought back to the company a piece that was choreographed, I think, in 1998 uh, called Shelter, which yes. was about uh, the homeless crisis yeah. originally. And you've brought it back, but with a broader resonance. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Shelter by Jaole Willa Josolar. Who does Urban Bush Women. Yes. She's choreographer, founder of mm -hmm. Urban Bush Women. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. And her work is always sort of deep. Mm -hmm. you know, and about the conditions of, of human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and this work, uh, Shelter, which really is about the crisis of homelessness, houselessness, or however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly it is meant to hold a mirror to society yes. so that we see our part in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was timely because I was thinking about shelter, but on a different level. Mm -hmm. Shelter meaning when you're in times of fear, mm -hmm. you look for shelter. And shelter can be a metaphor, not just a thing, you mm -hmm. know? And so when I started thinking about what the Ailey Company can provide, you know, is shelter. Mm -hmm. But also, I think it's, it's a timely work because at the, the end, she changed the text a little bit. There's a lot of text in the world. Yes. But at the end, she changed it to include the natural disasters like Irma, um, and, and different things of now so that we could see how this relates to the now. Mm -hmm. uh, global warming, all yes. of those things that, that uh, is reflected in that, that dance. So I think it's liberating to mm -hmm. see this. And you've now. chosen also to do it with an all-female cast, yes. which is not always the case. No, so. yes. So. Yes, which is powerful on a whole other level. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the delicious things in seeing the company is that there's this beautiful counterpoint between political pieces like mm -hmm. that one, and then more just exuberantly joyous pieces like your piece, Ella, yeah. which is set to the music of Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> Tell us a bit about the creation of that piece because it's it really shows your duality as both a musician and a choreographer. I've yeah. never seen such a beautiful physical representation of what a sound is like. Yes. So tell us about Ella, which is just pure joy. Thank you. <laughs> um, <coughs> Well, Ella, it's, it, it sort of comes from the fact that my mom introduced me to the music of Sarah Vaughan, Ella Fitzgerald, Nina Simone, all of these uh, Great amazing. American songstresses. Yeah, incredible. Yep. And so um, Sarah Vaughan being one of my favorite because I love the ballads and all of that, yep. still to this day, uh, you can catch me sort of singing along, but well, you won't catch me because I <laughs> don't do it in public. Anyway, um, but Ella Fitzgerald, I've always admired her scatting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's otherworldly. It's almost like she goes into some sort of trance mm -hmm. uh, when she does it, and the musicality of it, and mm -hmm. the, the surprise of it, the mm -hmm. fun in it. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make a, a, a physical scat, really, because mm -hmm. I'm always moving along to things that I hear that interest me. Mm -hmm. And so I made this work called Ella as a tribute to her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's heart pounding fast. It's very difficult to dance uh, because there's a, a movement on every sort nope. of syllable, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but it's a lot of fun because you can find the humor. You know, like there, there are certain moments that you, you hear words, she's not saying words, mm -hmm. but the tone of it you can hear. Uh, and I love playing around with that. So. Well, you play a lot with, with language. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. All the time. Absolutely. So you are, among many other things, a brilliant choreographer, okay. but the job of running a company is huge. You're the CEO, you're the cup shaker in chief, and you do it very well, <laughs> might I add. Um, if if anyone can make people part with their ducats, it's you. <laughs> uh, but where do you find the time and the space to still choreograph? And, and talk to us a little bit about that process for you. How does it begin? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely harder to find the time to choreograph, but that's yeah. okay, because luckily I did a lot of choreographing. <laughs> <laughs> we can go into so the vault. I go into yeah, what Judah Jamison calls uh, is the vault, and I mm -hmm. bring out little trinkets and whatnot mm -hmm. to distract people when I try to figure out how to make a new dance. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the inspiration is the dancers, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that moment where you get a chance to say welcome to the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, to some dancer who's probably been dreaming of this all their lives, it takes you back to where you were when you first saw the company. Mm -hmm. So that inspires me, and seeing them dance out their dreams on the stage night after night mm -hmm. inspires me. So in a way, that creates the space 
for me to make a dance because I make dances because somebody needs me to or wants me to, mm -hmm. not necessarily the other way around. I don't mm. think of it in terms of career. I think of it as another form of teaching, in a mm. way, another form of trying to form and inform and be informed by that body in the studio uh, that connects you to something within yourself and hopefully something for the audience. So that's really the inspiration there. Mm -hmm. uh, Ailey famously said, dance came from the people and I want to bring it back mm -hmm. to the people. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you personally? What does it mean today in our current context? Well, I think he, he did not want this to be a highbrow experience. I think because he experienced and saw what it meant to be left out, mm -hmm. what it meant to be told that you shouldn't or you can't. Well, and let's be clear, when he began, yeah. you, black people could not even go into a ballet studio. Exactly. So, so I think because of that, that informed uh, how he saw dance, how he saw the world, how he saw the world of dance, wanting it to connect with people. So never forgetting the people, mm -hmm. you know, sort of never leaving that connection to humanity. So that's what it means for me. It's just, to me, it means that we celebrate our common humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what I always try to remember uh, when I'm choosing dances, when I'm choosing dancers, that you want to have that as, as much as it can be fun, it can be abstract, but some humanity has to remain in it for me to like it. For all of us, yes, certainly. <laughs> now, it's the company's about to turn sixty in yes. a year. What are the big plans? Are there any plans? Can you give us a sneak preview? <laughs> of what's in store? As I look at Christopher Zunner, our <laughs> PR person in the back, going, "No!" <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a, these people have come out on a cold day. Give them the a little cold. nugget. <laughs> we'll definitely be performing Revelations. <laughs> we just decided, well, it's been working this long. Um, no, there's a lot of new things. Some of them are programmatic. Some of them are, are new in terms of, of, of uh, certain programs that we were doing that, uh, in uh, connection with the school and with our arts and education programs. It's sort of mm -hmm. just tying everything together. Mm -hmm. So we'll have, uh, I think, a lot more continuity in some of the things that we're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And then just pushing the envelope, new commissions, one that will be quite uh, significant about the life of, of Alvin Ailey. So we're, we're, we're doing past, present, and future. I think, in a, in a very big and bold way for the 60th. It is very, very exciting. So given that it's the holidays, uh, and yet we are living through a dark time, mm. what gives you hope? Hmm. I think what gives me hope, um, I think in some ways that we've, we've been here before in some way or another. We learn from our ancestors. So much that I learned sitting on the front porch watching my mom and her friends recite the poetry of Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. of Paul, Paul Lawrence, Lawrence Dunbar, Dunbar. Mm -hmm. you know, all of these people who told us something about our past and the fact that we survived it mm -hmm. from being brought over on slave ships to maybe even being the president of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. You know, so this notion of Alvin Ailey creating a company on the brink of the civil rights movement in 1958 and now being one of the most seen and celebrated country, uh, companies in the world, I think says something about the future. Mm -hmm. If they lived through it and not only survived but thrived, then why could we not do any better than that? And so that gives me hope. Well, well, well said. So now I want to open the floor for questions. All right. Hi. Hello and welcome. Thank you. I think it's beautiful to hear your success and the success of the company, especially as a uh, black artist myself. Um, I'm also a dancer and choreographer, mm -hmm. and I find that being out of school and living in New York City, it can be very, very difficult to find that sort of work-life balance and mm. being mentally and financially stable mm. and on top of that, creating work when you don't have certain uh, resources available to you. So can you offer any advice on that? That's, that's a tough one, you know, and we're, we're trying to do our part. You know, when I started uh, as artistic director, I started something called the New Directions Choreography Lab for that reason. It was to help 
uh, emerging or mid-level or what have you, choreographers have time and, and space. And not necessarily a commission, but time and space to just uh, invent and have a mentor be a part of that so they had somebody to look at the work and talk to uh, without the pressures of having a product because we're such a product-driven society. It's, it's, it's difficult, but, and I, I don't have the answer. I can say for me, I leaned on those mentors of mine, those teachers who didn't even know they were mentors of mine to help me find ways to do what I do. I think there's always a way, but you know, as artists, we always have to look, you know, when everybody's looking this way, we're looking, wait, I think I see a shorter line over there. <laughs> do you know? And so you have to always be looking for the shorter line. Like that's how I am at the airport. I do not settle. <laughs> there's gotta be another way. <laughs> so I'm not entry. standing here. It, global entry, but yeah. And it's, it's sort of not letting it ruin your spirit. That's the one thing. You have to use it right, to drive you. I really do believe that. And then you start where you are. You know, I just started making dances, and then eventually the stage and the audience and the commissions came. But I was making them on the fly. I got together with friends who were in the same situation I was in. You know, and once I started to build it, it started to come. But you have to be patient and vigilant. And remember that your imagination costs nothing, but if you don't use it, it'll cost you everything. You know, so. That's beautiful. That's, thank you. Yes. Hello. Um, I believe a lot of ex-dancers like myself are going to be watching this show, so <laughs> I got to ask you, um, today you've made it and you're this, you know, you really truly have succeeded in dancing. However, when like you know, the other audience member mentioned, when it is, when you were at Parsons, when you were at Juilliard, and life was like coming at you, and it was really hard, and you wanted to go back and give up, what was that thought, or what drove you to know? Did you feel that you were gonna be here? Did you know, mm. was this your only calling? Like, tell us about if the journey was worth the ending, but without knowing that yeah. you were gonna be here. Yeah, that, uh, great question. I think for me, I always knew something. I just didn't know what I knew. Do you know, does that make sense? When I was a kid, I always knew that there was some, something that I was supposed to do. You know, there was some, something calling. I don't know how to describe it. I just felt that maybe everybody felt that way. Uh, but also, I think for me personally, it was going back to that beginning of my great aunt and uncle taking me in. My great uncle, who was born in 1904, you know, who lived through segregation and, and, and worse than that, lynchings and all of that. Uh, he died my second year uh, at, into Juilliard. I happened to be home visiting, so I was there with him. I was the last person he saw before he passed uh, in the hospital room. So I say that to say that every time I felt like giving up, felt like giving in or gotten a review that was not as nice as the one this time. <laughs> Nothing can be more powerful than what he did for me. Nothing. And so that, to me, is a motivator. I think sometimes we have to look deep inside the well to get what we need to move forward, not outside. Outside, ooh, that could be trouble, you know? But I think sometimes it's better to turn inward and say, wait, wait, wait. It's like when I go home to Miami now and my mother still lives in the same house in Liberty City and I remember myself on the front porch on the marble floor trying to do double tours like Mikhail Baryshnikov. They were singles, but hey, <laughs> I, I tried. Um, then having my back porch be my dance studio, it was also concrete. <laughs> I mean, it, all of those things, though, when I remember that and then I come back into this, I maintain some part of that young self who was wide-eyed and curious and didn't know what he knew. And so if we remember that in those moments, I think it can carry you through the times of doubt. And just think of doubt as a friend that just shows up every now and then to keep you centered and says, I'm, I don't know about that. Right now, I'm doing therapy for you, but, <laughs> but but if you look at it that way as something to depend on, like being nervous before you step out on the stage, you're better able to sort of 
take the mountain and turn it on its side or, or look at it in context of the whole universe. And then you see that the mountain isn't quite that big. We have time for one more question. Hi. So I was, you were talking about how the arts kind of really affected your life and how it brought you to where you are today. I was wondering um, what it meant to you and also the fact that since the arts tend to be the programs that get cut mm. um, first, what do you do to make sure that kids do have access mm. to those type of programs? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's extremely important. You know, my first uh, mu music classes was at school, elementary school, and we were learning songs from Miss McCann. She was the meanest music teacher. <laughs> but I still remember the songs. I still remember what that did for me. Um, and so I'm disheartened when I see that the arts are being cut because I think the arts nurture the positive imagination. And we know what happens when the negative imagination uh, is nurtured instead. And so. For Alvin Ailey, it was important for us to have a robust arts and education uh, program. You know, that we, we do tons of outreach. Uh, not only the first company, but our junior company, Ailey too, uh, does a ton of outreach of getting into the community, especially communities who might uh, not otherwise be exposed. We have something called Ailey Camp. Ailey Camp was one of the last uh, programs that Alvin Ailey implemented before he died in 1989. Uh, so it, it, it uh, gives the opportunity to, to very young folks to be exposed uh, to dance and poetry and, and uh, all kinds of things that sort of um, enliven them and inspire them. In fact, one of my dancers came through Ailey Camp uh, and then into the school and all of that. So these programs are important to us and we keep expanding them like we will be doing uh, next year. So that's how we try to do our part. And we hope that people who may not become dancers but who have experienced the arts and education programs, that they spread the word or they in create it where they are. So that's the best that we can do. <laughs> so our delicious visit is coming to a close, but before it does, uh, I want you to let the audience know where they can see the company. We know you're at City Center through yeah. the 31st of yes. this month. Great way to spend New Year's Eve, better exactly. than a bar. Exactly. Um, and we are going on a 21-city tour, are you yes. not, thereafter. So yeah. where will you be going? God, some of the places, are, of course, will be at the Kennedy Center. In uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We'll be in Miami, my hometown. All woo, right. Woo, woo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we will be in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be in California. At some point. Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill. <laughs> All over. We'll, L we'll go to Austin, the website. Chicago. So basically all over everywhere. the United States. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there. We will be there. So, yeah, And yeah. they can see everything. They can see, see new pieces. They can see revelations. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yes. So please come out and support. Well, thank you for your words of wisdom. You've thank given you. us a lot thank to you. take forward in this beautiful season and in the new year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.